I want to invite you to have a seat, and if you have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone or iPad, that you'd open to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we continue our journey this year in walking through the Bible and looking at biblical characters who inspire us, who, who, who lived a life that would challenge us and help us to think about what our lives could look like. And then as we look at a modern person who's gone to be with Jesus, but who lived more in the current era in the last few hundred years who lived out that same kind of truth. And and so what we're thinking about today is the power of family faith to change the world. That if we pass faith on to the next generation, whether it's our children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews, as we pass faith on, how their lives can echo into our world and have an impact greater than we can imagine or dream. And we live in a time where a lot of parents and a lot of adults are afraid to pass faith on to the next generation. Well, you know, that's not my business. I don't want to force it on them. I don't want to pressure them. I'm not talking about forcing. I'm not talking about pressuring but you know any parent that says when their children are starting to grow up, I don't care if they're rude. I don't care if they never say please or thank you. I'm just going to let them decide how they want to live. No, parents say, what do you say, honey? Please, thank you. And they say it a thousand times, hoping that one day it will become part of who those children are. The parents can't make the kids be polite, but they can model it for them. They can teach it to them. They can pass it on to them. And we do that with lots of things, with kindness, with reading, Parents will say, I want, to, I want to teach you to read and open a book. And, and parents teach their kids all kinds of things. Why not faith? Why not the good news of Jesus Christ? Why not the word of God? There's nothing more important that we can pass on to children, to nieces, to nephews, to grandchildren, to spiritual children. Those of you that, that volunteer with our children's ministry, which has started again at the bottom, bottom row of, the, of our parking lot here. We started children's programs again. Our Bible memory group with fourth and fifth graders are, is happening. Everywhere. But we pour into the next generation. Why? Because they need to know the love of God. Because they need to know that there is a God who watches over them and cares for them. And so we're going to look at this woman named Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're going to learn some simple lessons from Hannah. You know, Hannah, her greatest longing was to have children. Particularly because of the world that she lived in, uh, she wanted to have a son. And that was something that was very important back then. But she wanted a child. She wanted a son. And, and year after year after year, it just wasn't happening for her. And some of you have known that journey, but she, she wasn't able to conceive. And so the first lesson we learned from Hannah is to bring your family pain to God. If you have family pain, bring it to God. There's no better place than to come and be honest about your pain than before God. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 1, in verse 10, we find Hannah in Shiloh, in the temple, to worship God, but she comes in prayer. Listen to, listen to her in chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, verse 10. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, that I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. That was about a Nazarite vow. He said she, that, that my child will be devoted to the work of the Lord. She literally meant that she would bring him to Shiloh, to Eli the prophet, and leave him there to serve in the temple. She said, God, if you give me a child, I will give him back to you. But I think every parent who's wise would say to God, God, if you choose to give me a child, I'll give, that child, I'll give her back to you. I'll give him back to you. There's no better place for a child to be than in the hands of God, Right? And so she prays this prayer. Now, Eli, who's the priest who should be wise enough to know what's going on, but he doesn't, he sees her and she's weeping and she's crying and she's, and she's sort of acting out with such passion and such depth of feeling, he thinks she's been drinking. And so, and so he, he talks to her and he says, you know, why, why, why are you drinking? And, and her response in verse 15 is she says, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. She poured out her soul to the Lord. Can I give you a word of encouragement tonight? Wherever you are, if you're online, here in the courtyard, our our folks in their cars over here, I want to give you a word of encouragement. If you have hurt and pain over family challenges, bring them to God. If you have a child who's wandered far from Jesus, bring them to God. If you have a family member, you don't even know where they are. They've gone off the rails. They've gone off the tracks. They're they're into addictions. They're struggling. They're hurting. And and, and you just hurt with them. Don't shut off those feelings. Bring them to God. As you feel, bring it to God. Because God's not shocked by that. God's not surprised. God is not offended by our honest pouring out of our hearts. 
Pour your heart out to God and do it day after day and week after week and month after year and year after year and decade after decade. Keep pouring your heart out to God. I want to share a short testimony. We actually have three folks that are going to share testimonies at the end of the sermon about the, the journey of family faith, but I didn't grow up in a family of faith. I didn't, in my overall extended family of probably about 100 people from our whole extended family, only one person I knew who had faith. Just one. I didn't grow up in this family where people loved and knew Jesus. But when I became a follower of Jesus, I wanted my family to know Jesus. And I had the joy. My sister Gretchen had already become a Christian. I had the joy of watching Lisa become a Christian, and then Jason become a Christian, and then finally Allison, the last of the five kids, raised in this agnostic, atheistic home. All five kids became Christians, three of us in ministry. But for 43 years since I became a Christian, I've been praying for my dad to know Jesus. That's been probably the deepest longing of my heart in terms of somebody who's far from God to know Jesus. And I've watched my dad go from being an atheist to being an agnostic to being what I call a friendly theist. I kind of believe in God and I think he's okay, but not a Christian. And Sherry and I sat with my dad just two and three days ago. We traveled home yesterday, but we went to saw him in North Carolina. And we sat with my dad and we shared the gospel again with him like we've done so many times. We shared the story of God's love, the reality of our sin, the fact that God sent Jesus Christ to pay for our sins and the fact that we could receive him by grace. We walked through that story for about 15 minutes and walked through the whole story of Jesus and got to where I've been with my dad so many times through the last 43 years. I have cried out to God and begged of God. And this time before he went, I said, God, I can't force my dad to believe anything, but I love my dad. I want him to know you. And many of you were praying. And so I, we walked through the gospel, and at the end of sharing the gospel, I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, is there any reason right now that you wouldn't receive Jesus Christ? And he looked back at me and he said, I can't think of any. And I said, then Dad, would you like to pray right now and receive Jesus Christ? And he looked at me and he said, absolutely. Yeah. After 43 years. And so I wasn't ready to pray yet because I wanted to make sure he knew what we were talking about. And so I said, Dad, and I kind of walked through it again, and I said, I said, Dad, you're ready to receive Jesus Christ right now. And he said again, he said, absolutely. And Sherry came over. I know we're in the middle of COVID and all that, but we held hands together and, uh, from a distance, but we kind of held hands, and we, and, we, and we prayed together. And my dad prayed to confess his sin to receive Jesus Christ. And I have to tell you that my wife has had her alarm set on her phone at 9 o'clock every night. She has her 911 prayer every night. We're at 9 o'clock for one minute. She prays for one person. That person's been my dad for years. And so we pray together almost every single night for my dad. And two nights ago when that alarm rang at 9 o'clock, we didn't pray for my dad to know Jesus. We praise God that he knows Jesus. We praise God that he's part of God's family. Someone say amen. amen. Yeah. And so thank you for your prayers. Many of you have walked this journey with me and Sherry through the years. But what I want to say to you is this. For 43 years... We've cried out for my dad. Hang in there. And we're going to have a time of prayer tonight together too. And when, you, when that person who's on your heart, who's been wandering for six months, for a year, for five years, for 10 years, whatever it's been, don't give up. And I've had people say to me, don't give up on your dad. And, I, and I've said, I'm never giving up on my dad. As long as he has breath, he has a chance to receive Jesus. Like the thief on the cross, we have a chance as long as we have breath in our, in our lungs. But I want to encourage you to be thinking about who is that person right now that's wandering? Because just like Hannah cried out to God in her pain and honestly cried to God, we can cry to God for our families. So here's a question. What pain can you bring to God tonight? What is the family pain, the struggle? And can you bring it to God tonight? We're going to have a time for you to pray and talk to God. Here's the second thing. Pray for your family members with heartfelt passion. So pour out your pain, pour out your struggle to God, but then pray to God on their behalf. If they're not praying, pray for them. If they don't believe in prayer, pray for them. If they think you're stupid to pray, pray for them. But pray for them. And pray for them even before they know you're praying. Hannah was praying for her son, who who would, would be Samuel, the great prophet and priest. But she was praying for him before he was born, before he was conceived. You know, you can pray for people before they're born, before they're conceived. It's beautiful. So look with me at 1 Samuel 1, 12 to 16. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. So this is what it is. He's watching her. The, the, the priest is watching her. He observed her mouth, and Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. It's like she was kind of talking, but nothing was coming out. And Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. He's scolding this woman as she's crying out to God with heartfelt passion. And so we read again these words. She says, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've been, 
I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant to be a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Share your pain with God, but also bring your needs to God. God, will you heal? God, will you deliver? God, will you draw this person to your heart? God, will you bring this person back home again? Whatever it is, cry out to God. Tell him your need. Don't keep it to yourself, but come before the only one who can truly deal with those things. And so here's a question for you. Who needs your prayers tonight? I think particularly in your family. Who needs your prayers tonight? We're going to go to prayer in a little bit. Be ready to pray for them and to cry out to God on their behalf. And here's the third lesson from Hannah. And I love this one. Devote your children to God for their whole life. If God gives you children, if you have grandchildren, if you have nieces and nephews, those little ones in your life, where you say, God, I pray that they would be yours. God, I pray that, I pray that they would be fully yours, completely yours for all of your life. For Hannah, she said, God, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you for all the days of his life. Man, what an example. And she, she literally brought Samuel to the temple and left him with Eli. And he became one of the greatest men in the history of God's people. But she prayed for him every, every day and she brought gifts every year to him at, at, at the temple. But in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11, we read this. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, I will not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And then verse 28, we read this. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord. There's a little boy. Samuel began to worship the Lord and follow the Lord. If you keep reading through First and Second Samuel, you hear his story. This was a world-changing young man. But it began with a mother who cried out, God, I will give my child to you. And I want to I encourage you to understand something. That from conception... I'm not, I'm not going to make a political statement here. I'm going to make a theological statement. From conception, Samuel belonged to the Lord. From conception, he was God's person that God was going to use. And God gave her a child, and that child became God's person for that time. John the Baptist in the womb, when he met Jesus in the womb, he jumped for joy. Jeremiah, we, we read in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, that God said, while you were in your mother's womb, I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. While you were in the womb, I appointed you, you will be my prophet. I'm not talking politics, I'm talking biblical theology. These three people were God's people chosen by God in the womb. Let your mind dwell on that. Let your heart receive that. Devote your children to the Lord. And get, let me give you one word of encouragement in our world. If you have kids, whether they're little kids, whether they're kids still in the womb, whether they're adult kids, do all you can to help them grow spiritually and do all you can to protect them from the evils of the enemy. Be careful about putting them in situations or exposing them to things that can damage them. We live in a world that has pitfalls and the world's always been evil, but the accessibility to evil right now and the accessibility to wrong ways of thinking is at the click of a button and that was never the case before. You have to, work, you have to be more careful to help your kids not be so exposed to things at a young age that they get damaged for good. And, and can I give you, I just need to give you a pastoral word of encouragement. If you have kids heading towards college age, would you be really prayerful and careful about where you send them to school? There are schools that are bent on destroying the faith of Christians. And if you went to a school and it was a great school when you went there 30 years ago, and you think your kid's going to it, now it's gonna be the same school. You go online, you find out what they teach, you find out what they believe, and you find out how they treat Christians there. You find, and there's places you can figure that out. And if it is a place that will destroy the faith of your child, but they get a really cool jacket with real cool letters and they could graduate and have a good job somewhere, but their faith is destroyed, you may give them the world and steal their soul. And so I want to challenge you, parents that have kids that are in, in that junior high, high school age, looking at where they're going to go to school. If for four years you're going to send them to a, way, a place that's going to shape their soul, you better do all you can to make sure that's not a place that will destroy their soul. Is that okay as your pastor if I say that? I, I want to challenge you to pray about this and to think about this. Because, because there are kids, I talk with so many parents who, who later regret putting their kids in harm's way, not realizing they were putting their kids in harm's way.
And so Hannah is this beautiful example of, of this family faith. She passed faith on to her child. But I'm going to share one more woman with you. Her name is Susanna Wesley. And Susanna Wesley lived from 1669 to 1742. Susanna Wesley lived, she, she married a man named Samuel. Interesting, not the same Samuel. It's a long time later. But Samuel, who was a pastor. And you think, oh, this wonderful story. She, well, Susanna Wesley was the 25th child of 20, 25 children. I'm not kidding. She was the 25th child born to her mom. She married Samuel, Samuel Wesley, who was a pastor. She had 19 children. Nine of them died as infants. Ten lived. Two of those ten preceded her in death. She faced hardship and pain. She was the primary educator of her children, as most parents were in those days, because school was a very different sort of a thing. Some of you are becoming primary educators of children right now, but that was the case back then. Twice the church parsonage burned down, and twice they were homeless. And one of those times, she had to ship all of her kids off to other people because she had nowhere to put them, which broke her heart. Her husband and her had a fight one time, and he left her for a year. Her pastor husband abandoned her and the children for a year. She had deep pain. Twice her husband ended up in jail for mishandling the family finances. But she taught her kids. All of her kids were expected to learn Latin, Greek, and know the English alphabet on their first day of school. Serious education. And this is beautiful. Every Sunday afternoon, every Sunday afternoon, she looked at her kids and realized they need to learn more about Jesus. Parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, listen to this. Every Sunday afternoon, for a couple of hours, she focused on the spiritual learning of her children. She had like a small school, class of kids, 10 kids. And every Sunday afternoon, she would teach them great songs of faith and teach them to sing praises to God. She would read one of her husband's sermons he had preached sometime in the past. She'd read one of the sermons to the kids. And she actually wrote commentaries on a lot of passages in the Bible and the great creeds of the Christian faith. And she would teach her children to know and to love Jesus for a couple of hours every Sunday. And other parents started watching her children and how they were growing in faith and came and asked Susanna, how, what are you doing? How are you helping your kids learn? She said, well, every Sunday I do this. So they said, can I, bring, can I come over with my kids when you're teaching your kids and can you teach us together? She ended up with about 200 people that gathered on Sunday afternoons to learn from her how to teach the next generation about faith. She took it that seriously. But there was heartache along the way. She wrote this in a letter to her husband almost a year after he had left, when he had left her and abandoned them. He came back after this, but she wrote this letter. And here's one of the things she wrote. Remember, this is, this is written a few hundred years ago, okay? Here's what she wrote to her husband. I am a woman, but I am also the governess of a large family. And though the superior charge of the souls contained in our household lies upon you, yet in your long absence I cannot but look upon every soul you leave under my care as a talent committed to me under a trust. I am not a man nor a minister, yet as a mother and as a governess, I felt I ought to do more than I have yet done. I resolved to begin with my own children in which I observe the following method. I take a portion... Just this is powerful. She says, I take a portion of time as I can spare every night to discourse, to talk with each child one-on-one. -on, -one. on Monday, I talk with Molly. On Tuesday, I talk with Hetty. On Wednesday, I talk with Nancy. Thursday, with Jackie. Friday, with Patty. Saturday, with Charles. And she goes on. One by one by one to sit with her kids and talk about life and faith, to engage them and to teach them. It's beautiful. It's powerful. And you say, well, how can... The investment of one woman changed the world. Well, her children, two of them, you've been influenced by. Uh, one's name was John Wesley, and John Wesley became a great pastor, theologian, evangelist, revivalist. You, you, will, you would probably not even know it, but heard pastors qu quote from him, talk about him. His, his theology, his thinking, his formation of what the church looked like was powerful and world-impacting. And another one of her children, Charles, and I think about this, I think about Susanna, um, Every Sunday, teaching them hymns and praise songs to sing. And one of her sons, Charles, caught on to that. And he wrote over 6,500 songs of praise. Her son, Charles Wesley, wrote over 6,500 songs of praise. Songs like this. If you grew up in the church, you might recognize some of these. And can it be that I should gain? Great theology. Christ the Lord is risen today. Written by one of Susanna Wesley's sons, by Charles. I actually, this morning as I was going over the sermon, 
I just went online and I opened up uh, YouTube and I put in Christ Lord is risen today. And I found this choral arrangement and just th- th- for hundreds of years, people are singing songs that Susanna Wesley's son Charles wrote, inspired by the leadership of his mother. Come thou long expected Jesus. Hark the herald angels sing. Love divine, all loves excelling. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing and about 6,495 other ones. <laughs> drawn out of a heart inspired by a mom who loved him. Here's some lessons from Susanna Wesley for us. Raise your children to love Jesus. You can't make them love Jesus, but you can raise them and point them towards Jesus the best you can. Know what you believe. Oh, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, know what you believe and teach it to the next generation and press through the problems and knowing that God is at work. Here's a question for you. How can you pray more for your family and infuse faith at a deeper level? How do you pray for children? How do you pray for siblings? How do you pray for parents? Can you influence your family? There is something powerful and beautiful about family faith. And I love in 1 Samuel chapter 2, going back to Hannah. After Hannah lays her son before the Lord and gives Samuel over to the Lord, she sings a song of praise. She prays. And we read this in 1 Samuel 2, verse 2. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. She's just given her son over to the Lord. She declares, you are the one who is holy. There's no one besides you. There's no rock like you. She declares the power of God in verse four. The bows of warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Man, she knew. She felt like she stumbled a lot of times, but she said, God, you arm me with strength. And then in verse nine, this trust in God. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, Hannah declared. While she waited for a child, when she offered that child to the Lord, she says, but God, you are faithful. Lord, we pray that we will be people that pass on a legacy of faith, that our lives would be so committed to you, we would know what we believe and why we believe it in such a deep way that we can live it out and share it with the next generation with integrity. So I pray as we have three different people come now and just share a testimony of family faith, of the power of family faith, Lord, that you will stir our hearts both to rejoice in those who have passed faith to us, but also commit ourselves to pass faith on to the next generation. So Lord, open our hearts and our ears to hear these stories. Inspire us and encourage us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My parents gave me a gift every week of my life growing up. They brought me to church. They didn't bring me to church one time a week. They brought me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. They were young. 21 and they had three kids already they would tell you they didn't really know what they were doing but they knew that going to church and bringing their children to church was the right thing to do and so they brought us to fourth reform church and fourth became our spiritual family and i got to be uh, um, spiritually parented by other people than just my mom and my dad who were great examples. But Nisha DeGroat, who would lead the little kids before Sunday school, whenever she would speak of Jesus, she would get emotional. And I was just a little girl, but I would look on and knew something real was happening in her heart, and it touched me. And then there was Mrs. Beery, who I could still see myself sitting in the classroom. And she said to each one of us, If you're ever afraid, if you ever feel evil, just say the name Jesus. I've never forgotten that. I just turned 60 a couple of weeks ago. I still do that, and I learned that from Mrs. Beery. And then Mrs. Postma, she was our pastor's wife, and I used to watch her, and I loved her. I watched her serve people and love people, and all I knew was I wanted to be like her. I had this little 
secret in my heart. I didn't tell people. I thought it was kind of funny, but I wanted to be a pastor's wife. The legacy of faith that my parents gave in the community of the local church changed me. And Kevin and I have sought to raise our boys in that legacy of faith. It has been and continues to be a great gift we offer. As Pastor Kevin spoke about generational faith, I truly see my faith being passed on from my parents. And even looking to my grandmother, it's something that was exemplified through their service when we would show up to PG High School at five in the morning to set up through their study of the Bible. And even through their sacrifices, sending us to camp and really making priority for us to grow spiritually. It's something that I really see as a benefit to me. And when I was challenged at Hume Lake, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna live for Christ or live for the world? It was the example of my parents that I really knew what I wanted to do and how I wanted to live my life. And it has poured me and pushed me into serving our community for Christ. And all of those things were blessings that helped shape me and showed me who Jesus was. But I learned how to live for Jesus by watching my mom and dad. My parents sought and still seek the will of God above all else. There have been seasons of blessings. There have been seasons of confusion, pain, and just absolute heartbreak. There have been seasons where it all made sense and then where none of it made sense. And through it all, they praised the Lord, they sought the Lord, and they chose to follow his will at any cost. And sometimes the cost was so great, so great. I saw them worshiping God with their hands raised, but I also got to see them crying out to God on their knees. When they had nothing left to give, I got to see my parents sit and lay and kneel before the Savior, broken at times, but yet fully aware that God was all they needed and that they would follow him to the very end. Um, I watch them cling to Jesus through every high and low and their authentic faith day in and day out through the good and the bad led me to fall in love with Jesus. The way they live their lives points me straight to the Savior. It did when I was a little girl, and it absolutely does now that I'm grown and out of their house. Their faithful pursuit of God is creating a beautiful legacy for our family, a legacy that I pray my husband and I can continue as we raise our precious girls to know, to love, and to serve the Lord with all their heart for all their days. Will you join? Will you join me? Will you join me in prayer? I want to invite you to think about who are those people who passed on a legacy of faith to you. For it might your yours might be like me. It may not be parents. It may not be Sunday school teachers when you were little because you didn't go to Sunday school when you were little, but somebody along the way passed on the legacy of faith to you. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody talked to you about Jesus. Somebody showed his love and his grace as they served. Will you just take a minute and thank God for those people he put in your life to direct you towards Jesus?
And then will you pray this simple to say but complex prayer to live out? Oh, God, may I leave a legacy. You say, God, may I leave a legacy to family, to friends. God, may I leave a legacy to people in my neighborhood that have never heard about Jesus. I may have physical children. Let me leave them a legacy. I may not have physical children, but God, you may give me spiritual children that I influence. May I leave a legacy of faithfulness to Jesus. Continue to pray that as Isaiah comes to lead us in prayer. considering the faith that we'd seen and that you brought back home. And for everybody, for everybody that is still missing God, is still out there, still trying to find fulfillment and truth and life on their own, please bring them home. Put us, put us in their lives. Give us a way to, to show your love to them. If they had any idea, God, if they knew what this life was like, the love, the joy, the fulfillment, the true the satisfaction that only you can bring us, if they had any idea, they would be running right back to you. So please let us be that light to them. As you put people in my life, put me, put us in their lives. Thank you. We love you. Amen. likeness Lord would that be on the forefront of our mind that as we live our lives like you those who are closest to us they see that they see the way that we walk the way that we talk the way that we love on one another Lord, would generations of family come to know you because of that reminder on our minds? We trust in you, Jesus. Amen. So the servant looked all around the hillside and saw the enemies of God surrounding the city. Dothan. He said, what shall we do? He's terrified. And the prophet looked strangely calm and just prayed, Lord, open his eyes. And for a moment, he could see the armies of God surrounding the armies of the world. Every battle is a spiritual battle. In some way, shape, or form, every battle you will ever face is a spiritual battle. And when you come to the table and remember the broken body of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus, and the victory of the cross in the empty tomb, we know who won every battle. Amen? 
Amen. So whether you're here in the courtyard or at home, I invite you to sit down, get your communion elements. If you're here in the courtyard, you get to kind of peel off the double layers of stuff there and get the bread in one hand and the cup without anything covering it in the other so you're ready to go at home. Uh, if you will just take uh, your elements there, if you have some bread or saltines and some juice or wine or whatever you have. And as we close our time together, we're going to close in communion. We're going to go back just to the chorus of that song for just a moment to close, but we're about ready to wrap up. But we're going to finish in unity together in cars, in the courtyard, up on the dock, at home, in unity together, remembering who's won every battle. Listen to God's word. The Apostle Paul writes these words in the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This act of communion is a simple reminder. We don't believe that the elements change. We don't believe that there's power in these elements. This is bread, and this is the cup. We remember the one whose body was broken, whose blood was shed. The power is in Jesus. And there's something about remembering what he did for us. It's powerful. So powerful that he encouraged us to do this again and again and again until he returns. And so whether you're at home, whether you're here in the courtyard, you'll take the bread and hold it in your hands. Whether you have a big piece of bread or just a little wafer, just hold it in your hands and look at that for a moment. And remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave for you. Remember that by his broken body, you're made whole. By his shed blood, your sins are washed away. Remember his brokenness and the price he paid. I invite you to take that bread and to partake of it. And as you do, remember that the body of Christ was broken for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. If you have faith in him, partake of the bread and remember the price he paid. And the cup which we bless is our communion with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Whether you're holding a cup at home, whether you have a little cup here in the courtyard, just look at that for a moment. Because what's contained in that is a reminder that the Lord of glory, God who came among us, who took on human flesh to be one of us so that he could die in our place, so that he could bear our sins, that his blood was shed to pay the price for you. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He has had mercy on us. Let's partake of the cup together. Lord Jesus, for your broken body, for your blood shed, we give you praise. We remember a hill called Golgotha. We remember that when your body was broken on that cross, when your blood was shed, when your life was yielded and you breathed your last, that you were declaring Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That you were saying to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. You came to save us. And the price you paid was the ultimate final price. We give you praise. We remember, Jesus, what you have done. And we remember that you have come in us now by your spirit. 
And even as the bread is now in us, even as the, the drink is now in us, let that symbolize, let us remind us, Jesus, that by your spirit, you dwell in us to empower us, to strengthen us, that we might shine your light, that we might impact the next generation. Lord, we don't know who the next Hannah or Susanna or Charles or John Wesley, we don't know who they're going to be. But we know that everyone who follows you, they leave a mark on this world. Every person who walks in the presence of Jesus by his grace is a world changer. And so we pray that this beautiful legacy of family faith will be passed on as best we can to our children and their children and their children and on. Whether it's physical children or spiritual children, we want to pass your good news on to the next generation. Thank you, Jesus for giving your body and your blood and your life for us. We now devote ourselves to serving you for your glory, to empower your church in this world that needs your church, even if it doesn't know it, and to go with your love to all the world and bring your grace. Just keeping your heart in that place of prayer. And then remain seated, but just keep your heart in that place of prayer. And actually, if you're able to stand, let's stand and just sing along as the worship team just takes us back through a little bit of that song. week or the ones you faced last week, but God does. Psalm 139 tells us that in your mother's womb, he knew you, and every day of your life was written in his book before one of them came to be. No matter what the world throws at you, no matter what you see or hear from anyone else, no matter what your heart tells you sometimes in your darkest moments. Those who are with you are greater than those who are in the world. That whatever surrounds you, the armies of God surrounds that. And that God is still on the throne. And every battle ultimately is a spiritual battle, and we know who wins. If you haven't read it lately, read the book of Revelation. We know who wins. We know who's on the throne. So in his power, in his strength, in the presence of the glory of Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Walk in that peace and bear that peace and share that peace for the glory of Jesus. Amen? I want to give you one word before you go online. Thank you for being with us. God bless you in the parking lot. Thank you for being with us. And in the courtyard, as you go, uh, just we're going to, it's kind of dark out here. I don't know if we even have lights that we can really turn on. But as you go, just follow the guidelines. Put your mask back on. We want to keep doing this till we can do it indoors or do it. Although this was kind of nice. Uh, but, uh, but thank you for joining us. God bless you. Hopefully we'll see you Sunday. Uh, we have uh, two services here and also four online. And so God bless you. And we'll see you on Sunday. 
I'm so excited to share with you two class options we're offering in both months of October and November here at Wednesday night at Shoreline Online. Join us for our good and beautiful life class, Say Hello to the Kingdom Life, led by myself, Pastor Sean, and a team of teachers. And Pastor Dennis is doing a class, Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. You may want to even consider attending both classes. Here's a little information on each class. Living in the kingdom of God is all about our pursuit to become more like Jesus. In our class, Say Hello to the Kingdom of Life, we will learn how to live a life without pride, greed, worry, and judging others. In this class, we will focus on surrendering these behaviors that cause us and others pain, and then replacing those behaviors with ones that make our lives better and honor and glorify God. We hope you'll consider joining us beginning Wednesday, October 14th. Well, hey there. Pastor Dennis here inviting you to join Shoreline's first class ever in apologetics, and it will be an ongoing track annually. It's called Tactics. Beginning in October, it'll be my honor to guide us by video and the Wednesday night discussion group using the work of Greg Kukul, founder of Stand to Reason, an apologetics organization. Tactics will help us adopt an engaging, disarming style of asking questions and conversations that helps us maneuver comfortably and graciously as we share our faith. We will be using the Tactics book and workbook as our teaching texts. I so look forward to having you join me beginning on Wednesday, October 14th. Go on our website and sign up now. Each teaching video for both classes will be posted online on our website on Wednesday mornings. Watch the teaching session anytime during the day before our discussion together on Wednesday evening via Google Meet. For more information and to register, check out our website at shoreline.church, Wednesday nights at Shoreline Online. We look forward to seeing you 